Hello, everybody, and welcome. I'm going to give people two more minutes to go ahead and join the call, and then we'll go ahead and get started. So we'll, we'll kick off at two minutes after the hour. So for those who have just joined us, I'm going to start in about one minute at two minutes past the hour. So please just hang tight and then we'll go ahead and get started. All right, everybody, let's go ahead and get started here. Welcome. Welcome to today's webinar, NIST 800-171 and CMMC 2.0, Noncompliance and What's at Risk. Before we get started, just want to cover some housekeeping details. So today's webinar is scheduled to last 45 minutes to an hour. It will include a Q&A session both throughout as well as at the end. Because the the questions we're going to cover were those questions that were were submitted prior to the webinar when you uh when you started or i'm sorry when you signed up for the webinar if there is an outage just wait a minute and then go ahead and refresh your page that should that should restart the webinar where you stopped for your convenience there's a link in the youtube description to a glossary of commonly used terms we are talking about government regulations and contracts, so there are a lot of acronyms, as you can imagine. You can reference that anytime during today's webinar. This webinar is being recorded. It'll be available on demand via the ExoStar resource library. That can be reached at www.exostar.com forward slash resources. Anytime after the event. Also, if you want to reuse that YouTube link you received in your email, that'll also replay the webinar for you. If you'd like to speak with us or one of our industry experts or request a copy of the slide deck that we use today, please go ahead and reach out to us at cmmc-team at exostar.com. Also, if you, visit, if you visit our website at www.exostar.com, there's a chat feature, so you'll be able to talk to one of our folks there as well. So today's webinar is planned more of a, as a panel discussion than a presentation and then feedback. What we did is we took the questions that were submitted prior to today's webinar. We broke those into groups um, and we did prepare a couple slides to if you will, embellish or or to to further build out some of that content. Um, we also do have some some general questions as well, um, and then we also do have an exit poll, which we'd love for you to fill out um, as we finish up. We use that exit poll to drive both the topics and the feedback for the webinar. So we greatly appreciate you working you filling those out um, as as we conclude today. So I'm joined on today's webinar. My name is Kevin Hancock. I'm with ExoStar. I'm director of sales engineering here at ExoStar by two great folks who are both customers and partners of, of, of ExoStar. 
I'm going to let them introduce themselves. So, Mike, I'll let you go first. Yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> my name is Mike Baker. I'm the Chief Information Security Officer for GDIT. Uh, so glad to be here. Again, if you don't know what GDIT, they threw some slides here, but um, mm -hmm. I've been with the company about seven years uh, in July, and it seems at least half of that we've been talking about CMMC and much longer than that, we've been talking about DFARS obligations. So again, I'm happy to be here as we get here to the final stretch of uh, where CMMC is going over the next year. Great. Thanks, Mike. And then I'm also joined by Tim Brennan. Tim? Hey, good afternoon, everybody, and thanks, Kevin and Mike, uh, for ha having me today. Uh, yeah, so so I'm CEO of CISARC. We're a, a small cybersecurity services provider uh, or and a managed services provider, or MSP. We, we've been working in the uh, defense industrial base for the basically since 2016, helping uh, small and mid-sized companies uh, build out and operate their cybersecurity compliance programs. And uh, we've probably worked with over 300 or so companies in the last three or four years on this issue. So we, we bring a lot of sort of experience and, and anecdotal information we're, we're happy to share. Great, thanks, Tim. So let's go ahead and get started with the, uh, with the presentation today. So we did get kind of the existential question, if you will, of what threats to my business exist today. Because Tim and his company spend so much time in both, um, you know, if you will, the CMMC and 800-171 compliance, did want to give him a chance really just to express, to, to kind of elaborate on the general threat today. So, Tim? Great. Yeah. So, so in addition to, you know, the compliance issues that the DOD Sort of is is asking everybody in in the in defense industrial base to deal with around theft of intellectual property and et cetera, uh, and which is sort of the, the you know the basis for for that those regulations. Um, you know, we we try to help div suppliers understand the other the other reasons for this, right? To 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 really get some cybersecurity implemented in your business, right? Um, you know, as, as hopefully all of you know, uh, defense industrial base is critical infrastructure um, in, in our country. Um, and there's bad guys out there basically trying to disrupt the supply chain. So, so initially there was a lot of theft going on from nation states, but you know, with, uh, with the current threat landscape, um, it's more of disrupting the supply chain, trying to shut down your businesses, no matter how small uh, or you know, uh, or, or large you are, um, if they can if they can shut down a you know manufacturer or some kind of part of the supply chain, um, it's going to be to their benefit. So we're seeing a lot of that, and if you you see some of the things on this slide that, you know, if you can go to some of these websites, you can see the update, you know, updated threat. You know, uh, certainly we're in this based on the the war in Ukraine and everything else going on. Around the world, um, you know, we're in a shields up kind of environment where a cybersecurity threats are, you know, as bad as they, they, you know, they could be probably. Um, and you know, I don't know if anybody saw the 60 Minutes this past Sunday, but you know, the director of the FBI is on there. He's very concerned. He's trying to get the word out as well. Um, and so, and so, you know, CISA and others, FBI, NSA. They're putting out these advisories and, you know, it makes sense to go in any, any business to get you go to these websites and see what's out there. Um, the thing I'd note on here is, uh, recently, uh, you know, in February and, uh, as recently as last week, um, you know, they issued alerts around Russia targeting defense contractors and some things to do, right? So. You know, these these four bullet points on the bottom left, they are prioritizing patching of known exploited vulnerabilities, enforce multi-factor, monitor your networks, including RDP and you know, desktop, you know, and VPNs, um, and then providing end user awareness training. That's how a lot of you know the bad actors get in is through uh spoofing and, and phishing attacks that you know maybe your employees aren't quite aware of. And, um, so, so that's 
that's what I would start with uh, as far as the threat landscape goes. Um, you know, it's a national security issue. It's something that we should all be concerned about and not look at it as just uh, another regulation that we have to comply with. Yeah, I mean, Kevin, if you don't mind, I'm going to take over for a second. Yeah, please. A little color, right. You know, from Tim, you know, from the front lines. And again, not to discount any of the threats that we saw prior to 2021, but um, if you've been paying attention in 2021, it was quite a uh, pivotal year as it relates to cyber and cyber protection, right? There's things that we had been discussing in industry as potential, you know, what could go wrong or big you know, potential risks that really turned out to come to fruition based on um, a very focused adversary that we're facing, uh, multiple focused adversaries that we're facing. So if you look at 2021 and it be began with the software supply chain uh, attack of solar winds, again, something we had talked about for a long time, uh, but we had never actually seen materialize, at least at that scale, um, that was followed by a string of zero day vulnerabilities, some of which had been exploited for a significant period of time before being discovered by, you know, security researchers. Uh, most of the cyber teams, uh, if you're listening on the call or if you run cyber teams, most of us have been on shields up or high alert now for a number of years, especially last year. So um, to, to your point, Tim, this is nothing new, but it's accelerating because as we went into 2022, we saw that cyber attacks were used as a weapon of actual warfare, of kinetic warfare, right? It, attacking uh, the energy sectors, right? Attacking uh, different other sectors of critical infrastructure within a target space. The application of destructive malware, not just ransomware to try to get money or uh, right. steal your intellectual property, but actual malware that creates the under, it destroys the underlying infrastructure. So, um, you know, again, I just kind of want to foot stomp your discussion a little bit there because we've been talking about CMMC now for you know, two and a half years, three years, we've been in the uh, the DFARS 7012 world for five plus years. Uh, but what we're seeing is these things come to fruition. And you had mentioned 60 minutes, right? This isn't a cyber problem anymore. This is a company problem. This is a board of directors problem. If you look again at uh, how our government's responding, this isn't just a DOD issue with their contractual regula uh, regulations. You're looking at what actions the United States Congress and legislation is passing around instant reporting. You're looking at actions taken by the Securities and Exchange Commission in terms of instant reporting uh, and, and requirements of public companies to have things like cyber expertise at the board level. So I think what we're seeing here is not only an accelerated threat landscape that's presenting serious challenges to cyber teams, but we're seeing a paradigm shift of how cyber is viewed uh, within companies, uh, not just in defense industrial base, but again, across the nation. Thanks, Mike. Yep, absolutely. So, um, as as we pivot a little bit more to, if you will, where, uh, around the CMMC NIST 800-171, as, as both Mike and Tim mentioned, we don't want to discount the general threat, right? But each of those you know, if you will, those the, those things that we should be doing today are 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 packaged within the NIST 800-171 and CMMC requirements. It's things we should all be doing today. Um, but you know, we, we we did get you know kind of again the general questions about you know what do I need to do? What are we looking to do today um, to 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 both solve requirements as well to um, to, to protect our companies and our and our information, um, oftentimes that does get practical, um, and and we do get that. Well, look, what what are auditors actually looking looking for me to provide if I am going through one of these, you know, one of these um, audits that that are that are uh, that are coming up or that I should be planning for. Again, I kind of asked Tim to take a take a lead on this because his organization does help a number of uh, of organizations out there today get ready for both the compliance side and what to expect when when somebody does show up and want to look at what you're doing. Um, so Tim, I'll ask you to take a take take the first um, shot at that. Okay, great. You know, I, I would add not just auditors, right? It's what your customer, whether it be a prime yeah. or 
or the DOD is really looking for, because the auditors aren't coming around necessarily for about a year or so, um, you know, unless it's DIBCAC doing a, doing a, you know, DFAR 7020 type audit. Um, but, but um, so, so, you know, I think everybody knows, but for those that don't, right, 7012, you know, NIST 800171 has been in, you know, <clears throat> around since 2017. And that's, that's the current requirement or law of the land. Um, and so, so some people have gone down this road, um, others haven't, but, and, and some have gone farther down the road than others, right? So, so the minimum requirements before the interim rule came out, you know, a year or so ago was to, to do a self-assessment, um, have a system security plan and, um, you know, create a POAM and start working towards that. That was, that was, you know, the requirement, right? Last year or, or late 20. 20, um, the interim rule came out and said, okay, now you have to go a step farther and provide an SPRS score after you do an assessment. It has to be done properly and, and, and you can be audited, right? Um, uh, <clears throat> intermittently. But um, what we're seeing recently on this is that primes, you know, are starting, and it's not like they haven't done this in the past, but they seem to be stepping up their enforcement at least from our perspective and what we're seeing in our customer base and the people that we talk to. Um, for instance, we've recently, one of our customers recently got, you know, a letter from a prime, which a lot of primes are sending out letters, please, you know, advise us where you are, et cetera, et cetera. We need you to get, you know, compliant. Um, but this particular letter was, was new to us and this customer, and it really talked about they had put us an SPRS score, provided an SPRS score that was in the mid 50s, which which if you understand the SPRS scoring system, negative 203 is the worst score and 110 is the best score. So 55 isn't terrible, but this uh, this prime told them that they were not going to be able to, you know, electronically send them any CUI um, and they would have to just send it, you know, via FedEx. Um, and this is a small manufacturer, right? This is uh, something that alarmed them because they're now being viewed, you know, as not being where they need to be, you know, competitively in this customer's, you know, in their well, customer's 50, contract. are they where they need to be? If it's a 7012 contract, right? So right. that begs the question. I, I'm interested in who, the, who that large prime is. I think I actually have an idea who that yeah. was. It wasn't me, um, but I can definitely say that uh, we are, leveraging SPRS scores as it relates to a data point in terms of the vulnerability within our supply chain. There is no doubt, right? The uh, 7019 was, in, in my opinion, a gift to a larger primes because now we can ask for a simple score before we used to ask a number of questions to deduce how well you even knew how to talk about 7012. Do you have an SPR, uh, SSP? Do you have a POAM, 110, medium assurance certificate, so on and so forth. But now it's quite easy. You see what's your SPRS score? And you either get a score or you get a no response, uh, both of which are valuable data as it relates to how you're going to use it to protect uh, not just the functional security of your supply chain, but also the reputation of your of your prime contractors as it relates to who you do business with. So um, I don't know, again, who specifically did that, uh, Tim, but I, I will tell you that we are leveraging SPRS uh, scores quite e extensively to start to make some decisions in terms of number one, who are we going to engage, right? And then number two, uh, to your point around FedEx versus electronic media, right? At some point in time, we're gonna have to draw a line in the sand in terms of what's acceptable and what's not, particularly for CUI, because it will be up to us to enforce um, this contractual, enforce it and flow it down to our supply chain. So we're gonna use all the data necessary to make those determinations. So it's an interesting development, and I would expect that that would only increase over the summer as we get to the expected end of the rulemaking period, which, you know, public comments from DOD have said is somewhere around May of 23. So uh, if you're a small business on this, um, I would expect more things like that. I would be expected to ask for your s score, and if it's low, some sort of mitigation plan, because at some point in time, that's a risk to continuing the relationship. There's no doubt about that uh, if you cannot comply with CMMC.
Because again, you won't be able to POAM certain highly valued controls. So if you're looking at the DOD assessment methodology and there's a, a five score uh, control, take FIPS off the table, that's a different one. But any other five score uh, control and DOD assessment methodology may be hard to POAM for any significant period of time. So at what point do we have to ask ourselves as, as primes, do we have to set a backup plan if you're not gonna be able to comply in time after May 23 with a 60 day window? Oh, thanks a lot, Mike and um, and Tim. Because uh, you know, I do. I really do just want to kind of kind of re reiterate that because that seems to be right now kind of that bar, right? It it is getting that spur score, right? It is it is doing that 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 initial assessment of how you're doing against against the 110 controls, getting that spur score because you know and and. Mike, correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like that that's kind of the first question right now people are asking, right? You used to maybe get a, a long questionnaire with all 110 controls, tell us which ones you're 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 working with, et cetera. But you know, it seems the shorthand now is what's your spur score? And yeah, why would I waste time on asking some long survey? Um, right. <laughs> I remember back in the day, Exostar made a really nice long survey that tried to do some sort of compliance. It's very simple. We have an existing DoD assessment methodology. We have an existing DFARS uh, to uh, 7012 that's in effect that's been flowed down on most of these CUI contracts. And I think it's a pretty, at a base level, we've existing, again, DFARS <laughs> around an SPRS score. So uh, if you don't know the DOD assessment methodology, if you haven't engaged in a, a thoughtful and transparent fashion on the SPRS score, I think you're at risk more than just with your, your prime partners. I think you're at risk because you're entering um, a number within a DOD system that it, that has to be, you know, it can't be disingenuous, right? It, right? it has to be accurate to the best of your knowledge. Yep, absolutely. So, so if if I just continue on down through this slide and just make a couple more points, so so, um, you know, uh, we've heard from DCMA who are doing random DIPCAC assessments um, to to get a feel for you know people who submit a score. Um, they may submit a high score. They want to check it out to make sure they're they're being accurate, or they may submit a low score and they're on an important program and they need to figure out uh, where where they need to uh, solve their issues. Um, so 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 John Ellis, who's running sort of that program over there, um, he's come back and, and you know and spoken several times to uh, the public basically about some areas that he's seen uh, over and over again that. Um, you know, are lacking in, in a lot of um, the audits that they're doing. And, and these four bullet points, uh, lack of multi-factor, again, that, that's a low-hanging fruit, right? It's, it's low cost, even though it's, it's hard to do in a large organization to get everybody on multi-factor. But there's, there's, there's pretty low-cost, simple solutions out there for, for tackling that, right? Um, Another big one for everybody, nobody likes to write documentation and do policies and procedures, but, but for instance, that, that, that uh, customer of ours, you know, um, their, their score would probably be closer to 100 or 110 if they had, would, would get on with uh, developing their policies, right? They've right. done a lot of other good things, but that, that's an area that uh, across the board is lacking. Um, and we well, so I'll just... Just interrupt you there for a minute, because we get this question a lot. It's like, well, we do that, but it's not necessarily documented. And do I have to document it? Sure, you have to document all your policies and the procedures uh, around those policies. And that's what the auditors are going to look for uh, to, to see if you have a plan. And then how are you implementing that and enforcing that plan or all the way through your policies and your procedures? Um, but also keep in mind. Focus on the SSP first, because again, you, I mean, again, policies are policies, right? But when you look at 800-171, that SSP can be an articulation of your intent and your plan. It quite frankly yeah. is your plan, right? Yeah. Um, so my recommendation would be if, you know, you're choosing between writing a bunch of crap on paper or actually making substantial technical change to move the risk needle within your company, do the latter, right? Sure. Or yeah. whatever, do the second one. Right. right. Um, <laughs> do that. And then, you know, you can get by with an SSP if you communicate it appropriately to your end users and things like that. But right. do the things that make your company safer, not the things that make your company compliant. That's what I'm looking for. I agree wholeheartedly. Mm -hmm. 
I also want to say the FIPS, the FIPS 140, that's probably the hardest one. Just, um, and again, I'm on the CMMC AB industry advisory group um, in which we engage with the AB directly. I would say that's probably the one control that at scale presents a pretty significant problem for most people, most companies rather. So um, that's the one, I just think the third bullet's the one that gets probably the, the most leeway in terms of how it's implemented and, and what you've, the expense you put towards it. My advice would be is to, for number three, is to have a decent data flow diagram associated with CUI, right? Uh, going in and out of those segments in bullet four or not, right? And then clearly articulate what areas when it leaves your boundary are FIPS validated encryption, right? And right. generally that's been met with a decent amount of success. And I think it will um, definitely into the, the short to medium term because th that's a hard one. And I think it's acknowledged by DOD and pretty much anyone else that looks at it. So Mike, I have a question for you then. Um, on the smaller companies, right? Um, would you would you recommend just um, looking at all of their data versus just the CUI and, and trying to trying to do FIPS validation encryption? Or are you are you recommending for the smaller companies to, to try to break that stuff out and and data flow diagram? I mean, I think it's it's different. It could be different strokes for different companies, right? Yeah. Um, I think you have a macro choice. Do I bifurcate my environment into DOD serving that holds CUI versus one that doesn't? I think that's highly dependent on the mix of the business that you do. I can say we do not, right? It's because I, right now I kind of know where my CUI is. I know where it's flowing, but uh, we don't have an enclave model in which we say this is strictly DOD and this is strictly not. Um, it makes more cost efficient sense for us at scale just to do it to those uh, specifications and it's decent cyber as well, right? Uh, but it depends if I'm running a small business and I'm 20% DOD and I'm 80% commercial or something else, it may make sense uh, and may be viable cost wise to run two different environments, but you do run into technical challenges there, right? Um, if you're running on a you know, regulated Microsoft 365 cloud like GCC High, you can't share identities with Microsoft 365 commercial. So I think there's there's definitely a trade-off in usability, operability, and cost that is going to be different for each company. The fact of the matter remains is you have, if you have a good story of where you're receiving CUI or where you think you're receiving CUI and where you think that's going within that boundary or outside, um, it's always resulted in, in a solid conversation. Yeah. Awesome. All right, and then finally, um, you know, we 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 want to try to lay out a you know a simplified sort of roadmap to to getting compliant. And again, you know, at the end of this sort of journey, hopefully, you're a lot more secure overall and not just compliant, as Mike was mentioning earlier. Uh, we we start with a you know with assessment or gap analysis um, around this state under one seventy one. Um, out of that comes an SSP and a POAM and your SPRS score, right? And we're currently using Certification Assistant, SexoStars solution for that. Um, and so a lot of companies, you know, do get stuck if they don't have the expertise in-house, whether they don't have any advanced cyber people or, uh, you know, IT department that can work through that, that you know, NIST 800-171 requirements, um, you know, we, we and others, right? There are a lot of uh, companies like ours, other MSPs and other uh, RPOs within the CMMCAB ecosystem that, that can help um, do that in a, in a you know, much shorter time frame um, and for a lower cost than you might think. Um, and, then, and then once you have that, right? So then you need to start working on completing your POAM. Um, most companies have some issues, some have a lot of issues, and some have fewer, um, depending on their circumstances. Um, our firm, we've worked really hard as an MSP over the years, managing network environments for our, you know, uh, government contractor customers. And we've done the same thing for, for this particular solution set around trying to provide low cost, efficient solutions that you can, you know, outsource um, to a company you know, either some of the things you don't already do, 
uh, or or just all of it. Um, so so we're flexible. And again, there's a lot of other MSPs and other firms out there um, that you know are doing a good job at this. And there's quite a few that are you know not quite as experienced or professional. So you have to be careful. Um, you know, just like you would hire any other kind of vendor for doing some kind of work for you, just, you know, just, um, <clears throat> you know, do your due diligence there. But it can be done for less than you might think um, in, in, in certain models, right? And then, again, once you've sort of completed your POEM, you should be NIST 800 171 compliant. You know, be 110 SPRS score. You would update your score. You should be way more secure than you were before you took that journey. Um, and then, really, at this point, you'd be you'd be you know ready for a CMMC 2.0 level two audit. Uh, and again, this is for folks that uh, have CUI in their contracts or you know that that need to get to level two. So one specification, right? SPRS does include. Um, where your POAMs are. Yes. So the, a POAM, you know, we have migrated away from the thou shalt not have POAMs uh, rhetoric that it, of like two years ago, but we are solidly in the time bound POAM right. rhetoric now, right? So if you think of the timing to your point, if you do an assessment, I'm just kind of following along on number three, Tim, you do an assessment, you figure out where you need help. Uh, a POAM is simply a register of work that needs to get done, a manner in which the risk it presents to the organization and how does management prioritize the investment, right? But if you think about prioritization of that investment, uh, you're looking right now, we're nearly in May, right? So it's 13 months until supposedly this interim rule comes out, 60 days, which is July of 23, which it shows up in contracts and all POAMs at best case scenario based on public data, and public uh, discussion from DOD is 180 days. So at best, at best, your risk starts in July. And if you get one of those contracts, one of the first that would exist here in July of 23, then again, you would have to be fully compliant by the end of tw uh, 2023. So you're looking at a little bit more than a year and a half, which quite frankly, given where we've been over the last three years is a darn Christmas present. Right, we should be prioritizing that investment now. So I think my point is, is that if you don't have a poem, you don't know what you're doing, and you don't know where you need to prioritize that investment. You are, you you had run out of time. DoD gave you a gift with CMMC 2.0, so now's your second chance to get on it. You have about a year and a half to make those corrections, which can be pretty significant from a cost perspective, which take right. a lot of time to talk to uh, senior leadership of an organization and say. You know, we need to set, we need to spend this money if we still want to do business with DOD or at least have uh, our business with DOD not be at risk after 2023. Great points, Mike. Great points. Yeah. So want to move. Let's let's move a little forward here. So because CM, you know, um, 800-171 really is about that CUI. We get a lot of questions about how do I define CUI. There is no definitive guide out there. Um, you know, the, the one thing I typically go back to is, look, it's it's the responsibility of the originator to mark things as CUI. It's con you're you're contractually obligated, if you will, because of the DFARS clauses. But, you know, I guess, you know, Tim and Michael, I'll, I'll open up to you guys. So, how, you know, where how do we define it? What is it? DODCUI.mil. Right. right. Uh, yep. So there is a definition of CUI out there. I think the challenge with CUI is it's not consistently marked within the contracts and there's still some issues, you know, with the perception of that within, you know, the DOD customer space, right? So I think to your point, I think it's, um, and I think it's been acknowledged by DOD that they have to get better uh, at CUI and rolling out that program and making it consistent across the contracts. So I think there's, I think there's kind of like two things to this, right? One is, yes, it has to be marked by the customer. And you have to be prepared to receive it and understand right. where it flows within your network, but also to your supply chain, in my case, my subcontractors. So most of my effort is not complaining about the fact that CUI isn't marked by my customer. It's making sure that when I do receive that document, I know precisely where it's going, 
both within my network and outside of my network. So that's what I've been investing in. In the meantime, is creating those tools and processes to be prepared for that. I think the second part of this is marked or not, it's a broad generalization of, of what data is that presents a risk to our country, right? So for me, my success criteria is I have the full power to say, this looks like CUI, it smells like CUI. It may not be marked CUI, but I'm gonna do the right thing and I'm yep. gonna protect it anyway, right? So, you know, some of the complaints about CUI, I think I think they're valid from, from an academic perspective, but I think from an intent and more of a spiritual perspective, I'm gonna look myself in the mirror, I'm gonna do the right thing every step of the way, and I'm gonna yep. invest in trying to track it when I do when I do get the markings more consistent. Good point. Good point. And the only thing I would add to that is going back to the previous discussion about you know, your data and your customers' data. Um, our philosophy is is let's protect it all, right? Whether it's CUI or not, because your other data that's not your customers, you know, CUI is probably just as important to you. Um, and, you know, if uh, if that gets stolen or or shut down, um, you know, you're going to have a problem, even if the CUI did not get let out. So so our philosophy is just take a, you know, a holistic view of this and let's 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 put in programs in place that protects it all. Only um, Tim, if we had said earlier, the the bifurcation of the environment or an enclaving in the environment isn't right. feasible or operationally feasible. Right. Sure. Absolutely. Okay. So because there's also so we got we got a lot of questions around the, around CMMC, right? Because that that's kind of what's what's next on everybody's mind. And a lot of the questions were around this, you know, this level two where you've got kind of this this choice, if you will, right? There's going to be some that will, that we understand will be required to do uh, an audit, if you will, that, that third party assessment. And there'll, and some will be able to have a self assessment. Any, you know, if you will, further, you know, intelligence on kind of what's going to be what or how, how that's going to be determined. I'll start with you, Mike. I would say if you have CUI prepare for a level two assessment to the 110 controls of NIST 800-171, I think weaseling around the splitting, or I said bifurcation now four times. So I'm just saying the splitting <laughs> of level, I think weaseling, I think that would be misguided, um, yep. in my opinion. Uh, there's been uh, different stuff coming out just, you know, in the public. I don't know what to believe that, that uh, the splitting and bifurcation at that level was gonna happen, that it wasn't gonna happen. Um, you know, if I was a betting man, again, I don't speak for, for DOD or anyone like that, but if I was a betting man, I think that um, it would be few and far between in which it's a level two contract that is, is relying on a self-assessment. Um, so from my perspective, I would proceed like you need to do it because you're likely in a 7012 contract anyway. Yeah. Yeah, fair enough. Tim, any thoughts? I, I, I agree. We've heard that they were, you know, initially when they came out, they were going to bifurcate, and then they've walked back the, the percentages quite dramatically to very few would be exempt from from an audit. Um, I think you know the big issue for them is is you know having enough auditors, right, yeah. uh, to to get to what potentially is the the thousands of level you know two. Uh, companies out there that need to get through that process, right? Um, and you know, there's pushback because the audits are probably going to be, you know, fairly expensive um, to to go through and time consuming, et cetera. So, um, but you know, they it, that's my only that's my only comment on that. Okay, fair enough. I would say pay attention to level three too. That's yeah. still kind of in the works. In terms of what controls from 800-172 will be included in those expectations, how that would be applied. I would, again, as a betting man, just speaking for myself, I would say we have a little bit more time, you know, as we kind of proceed, you know, 23 and 24, but that is going to represent, if you're working on a major program, look up what enhanced CUI looks like, right? Weapon yeah. systems, things like that. Things are, that are usually rated a high impact. Um, and I would start to really think about that, even if it's a couple of years early, because that right there is a paramount shift in terms of investment and capability. Good point. 
Okay. So we kind of already talked about this, right? So I'm not gonna, we won't spend any more time on that. Um, now, there was that, if you will, there's the, what I'd call kind of this, whoops, sorry about that, the level one. So where, you know, where are we gonna make, where are we gonna make that cutoff on what's level one versus level two? Because, you know, we get a lot of questions of, you know, I'm a small shop, I'm, I'm a single, single person entity, et cetera. Any idea where we're kind of making that determination? Uh, FCI versus CUI, Kevin. It's right there on your diagram before, right? Oh, I'm if, sorry about that. If you yep, take custody right. of federal contract information, it's kind of the catch-all, 17 controls, um, pretty much the absolute bare bones necessity. Uh, if you're CUI, you get up to level two. Right. But it, it really doesn't have much to do with how small you are. It depends right. on which, right? So, so right. there are some considerations, right, for small companies you know the scalable part is potentially the, the the you know the the size and number of tools and things and processes you have to put in place versus a much larger company you know thinking about bifurcating or building an enclave etc um, but the requirements themselves right aren't necessarily scalable right but i'm a firm believer in if you're a small company looking to scale right or when i hear scalable i mean as cost efficient as humanly possible with that with the most little amount of effort from human beings within my company, right? So yeah. that would be get yourself familiar with the cloud services that you can leverage. I, I think we had talked about the MSSP environments and things like that, because yeah. you got to make the decision rather quickly. Do you build it or you buy it? And in the CMMC world, if you're a smaller company, um, I would hazard to think it may be cheaper to buy it, depending on what yeah. vendors you're looking for. So when you look at cloud providers, um, you're looking at a shared responsibility model. When you're looking at MS, MSSPs, you're looking at a shared responsibility model. So I would, you would need to educate yourself on that rather quickly in terms of where the responsibility lies to implement the, the new. So. Right. And that always kind of leads me to that, you know, much of the scalability is part around that SSP, right? It's where am I going to draw that boundary? Where, you know, and, and to your point, um, Mike, it's, look, then you got to make that decision. Do you know? Do I? Am I? Am I in one environment? Am I in two environments? Et and that that at the end of the day is going to be a business decision based on you know, based on what you do, and how much of your organization is involved. So, okay. So, just kind of kind of recap what to, what needs to be done today. What we've talked about, right? Kevin, this, sorry to interrupt. Oh, you sorry. didn't talk about no. the COTS question, which is oh, I'm sorry. You're right. Right. You're right. You're absolutely right. I, sorry. I do want to touch on that because. You know, COTS providers have been, you know, they've been dancing in the fields here for three years being like, I'm exempt from this. Hey, awesome, right? So I, I do believe they're still technically exempt from these flowdowns. However, look back at the May executive order from uh, last year, and you're gonna see a significant amount of potential FARs and or DFARs coming out around, you know, secure software development frameworks, requirements around how you test your code, and then also the delivery of a software bill of material. So if I was a COTS provider, I would actually be more scared of that than I would be of CMMC because I've been out in the industry here asking who can give me an S bomb because you know last year in, in May of 21, President Biden said everyone's got to get ready for an S bomb, and I still have yet to receive one bill of materials of consequence from a major COTS provider, right? And you're, we're going to see these soon. You know, the executive order said a year, and a year would be next month. So I don't know if that's actually going to come to fruition, but at some point it will, because solar winds is not going to go away, at least the government's response to it. So if you're a cost provider, please look at that and get ready for that and be ready to engage your customers on that in, in the short term. Great point, Mike. And I and we actually talked about this before the webinar and I and I skipped over it. My apologies for that. I, I would say that the, the other key there is around the COTS provider. So many COTS providers now are moving to that cloud services provider model. And that's that's different in this space. And there are some, you know, to your point, there are additional things you're going to have to be able to do. And you've got to prepare yourself for those things as well. So, you know, commercial off the shelf software is often now a cloud service rather than that. <laughs> so, so think about those things as well. So. We spent a lot of time about what needs to be done today. 
right? This is all tied to your DFARS clauses and getting NIST 800-171 compliant. What is expected, hopefully that everyone's heard today, is, is doing that assessment and getting your SPUR score determined. Figure out where you're at and then figure out what you've got to do to get fully compliant because that's what you're going to be asked to do and that's what you're going to be have to basically say, tell people what you're doing. So on the on the on the firm timeline, so so Mike, you'd mentioned some dates out there. I just kind of want to kind of reiterate those, if you will. So, you know, what we've all heard is, you know, the the CMMC two, it's in the rulemaking element. You seem to think, and I kind of agree, it's it it's kind of about a 13 month window until we start well, to see it implemented. That's based on public comments by DOD, yep. right? Yeah, absolutely. And, um, yep. But I don't think there's anything firm in CMMC world whatsoever. And I also okay. think those comments are a guesstimate. Yet, um, it's a pretty strong indication of when we can expect that interim rule to hit, which would be May of 23, with a 60 day window for it to start showing up in contracts of July of 23. Okay. Fair enough. So, who's responsible for enforcing compliance? The receiver of that contract and DOD. Right, so uh, pretty. Um, it it was very clear uh, when they did CMMC 2.0 that one of the kind of guiding strategic principles was to hold primes accountable for the cyber hygiene of their supply chains. Right, so um, again, if I was a betting man, I'm not in the not anywhere near the rulemaking process. That's still going to maintain a theme as, as that comes out. Great. Okay. Um, So what happens if you haven't submitted a spurred scores yet? You are not in a position to articulate any level of compliance to existing uh, DFARS. Right. Uh, in my opinion, would be uh, an admission of, uh, you know, perhaps a bad score. Right. right. Yeah. So, yeah. Exactly. It's kind of so generally speaking, right? You're looking at DoD assessment me methodology. You need some base level of capability to kind of go through that, understand it and score yourself, but it's not it's not a huge exercise to get that score in there. Um, and I have had people say, I don't know my score or I haven't submitted it. Um, and that is viewed, at least by me personally, as extremely unfavorable as it relates to someone that wants to do business with GDIT within our supply chain, particularly as we're marching towards the kind of the, the end of the road here with CMMC 2.0 and it's gonna be in contracts here uh, next year. Yeah. Thank you. I, so, I would only I would only add to that that it, it, it's it's not as daunting as people think it is to go through that process, and it gives you a really good indication of where you are and what you need to do and start planning and for both the costs and, you know and the resource requirements to get there. Yeah. So uh, there are lots of tools out there yep. uh, and, and ways to get there. So it's a just, gift. Yeah. It's a yeah. gift, right? Because yeah. you like. You, you have a sentence that's kind of broad and general, and you got to have that cyber person make sense of it and how that works within your company. And then DOD assessment methodology, some pretty specific questions and weighted scoring and things like that. I mean, use the weighted scoring as prioritization because that's what it is, right? Yeah. Um, so again, there is plenty of resources out there to get this thing done. It doesn't take that long. Yeah, and it, it's been, it's been, well, it's, it's been the law of land for, for a while now, so. Need to jump to it. Um, let's see. So, so Mike, what are you guys doing today to check to see if people are compliant? Well, we're asking the questions, right? We're okay. still in. We don't have a contractual requirement outside of seventy nineteen, seventy twenty to flow down. If that's the case, seventy twelve. Yep. Um, so, you know, we are. You know, we have. I would say a two pronged approach. One is we're continuing to get out there and educate, just like we're doing now. We, we have opened our doors to collaborate and talk and discuss. So we've made ourselves uh, very available, at least TDIT has, to engage with our supply chain on what these requirements are. But we ask that people come to the table and have that discussion because we will be asking in 7019s around what the SPRS scores are. And as we get closer to uh, potential impact next year, we're gonna have to make some decisions on whether this is a business that 
um, is going to be ready to comply in time. And if it's not ready to comply in time, that's a that's a business risk, right? If we can't if we can't field the work because the subcontractors uh, not up to snuff as it relates to uh, the new DFARS that comes out next year, that's a that's a serious problem for us that we're going to have to rectify. Absolutely. Okay. Um, so we. Uh, on the POAM side, right? A lot of people used to, it used to be, well, you know, I've done my, I've done my assessment. I've got my POAMs. I'm NIST 871 with X number of open POAMs. Um, and I, I thought this was interesting addition. Is this an acceptable long-term solution? There is a window in which you need to close your POAMs, right? The M in POAM is milestone. It's when you're supposed to be able to, you know, if you will, finish this. You know, Mike, to your earlier point, this is a work item that needs to be addressed. Um, so, you know, on that, I guess when when is it when is it expected? And and Tim, I'll I'll ask you to comment first. When is it expected? Because you're kind of in this business that I should be able to close my poems. I mean, it was always uh, sort of like uh, what's realistic, right? When you're talking to companies and 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 uh, the primes and the and the you know DoD, they they understand what you know what's what's acceptable and what's not, right? Two years is not acceptable for most things, right? But you know, so we 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 tend to work with each individual business and say these are the things that need to get done, um, and we give them sort of a very good idea of. The level of effort of that, uh, yeah. of those items, right? And, and we can tell them this, this is how when when you know, we think you can get it done by, uh, if you make this investment, right? Um, and then let them sort of you know fig, put that into their business planning. Um, but you know, again, there's there's a like Mike said earlier, right? Fix the things that are really going to make you more secure, that are you know technical things that you can do. You know, some low hanging fruit and some items like that, uh, that gets you, you know, a long way quickly, you know, and, and more secure, uh, and then just keep working that thing down. And, and again, with the Mike's point to, you know, look at the items that are, you know, are, are, you know, have the 5 points to them that, that are more important to, to, you know, your customer and your prime that you get those done as well. Right. Um, it's a pretty good roadmap. Absolutely. It is the roadmap. <laughs> it is the customer roadmap, right? So, yeah, use it. I mean, Tim, like you said, it, 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 everyone's like, I don't, my, my customer's expectation is this. It's all right there. Yep. Great. So just want to remind everybody as we, as we get closer to wrapping up, there, there, will, there is an exit poll in the comment section. Please take a minute, fill that out. So we did get the question about, about how can Exostar help? So I'm always happy to, to plug Exostar since I work here. Um, so we have a number of solutions in this area. We have two solutions that work within the 800-171 CMMC compliance um, um, stack, if you will. One of those helps you build those policies. It's called Policy Pro. It, 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 it it walks you through or or provides some templates around the policies to implement, allows you to score your policies that you've written, determined to make sure they're, you know, they fulfill the requirements. That then feed, can be fed into certification assistant, which walks you through those 110 controls, does the scoring to 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 create that but that um, you know, the output, if you will, is that SSP. It's any open poems you have against it, and it is your current spur score. You can then use the tool itself to close to, to close those poems, work against those, and obviously improve that score and get uh, and get fully compliant. Once you're you know kind of working in in that space, you know what you're doing. We have two other applications that can help you both track your compliance across your supply chain. And then also to help you provide a secure enclave and a secure area to both work with and share that CUI information amongst yourselves and with your third party partners. There are a number of no cost resources out there would it would ask, you know, everyone to take advantage of these right? This stuff. 
everything you know we talked about the information's out there please go take a look educate yourself on on what's needed now we also did get some general questions so um tim i was going to ask you first or um yeah so it it um we got one for um for 3.9.1, screen ind individuals prior to authorizing access to organization systems containing CUI. Is there anything documented that constitutes proper screening or background checks? Uh, probably that's a that question's above my pay grade. I'd probably have to ask my CISO. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Fair technical enough. team, but uh, Mike probably has the answer to that one. I don't mean to yes. put you on the spike. Spot. No, you're not putting me on the spot. I mean, I don't have that control in front of me, but I think it's pretty clear. It says screen your employees before they can have access to CUI, right? It doesn't specify what, you know, the extent of that screening or, you know, do you put them in a lie detector, you know, whatever. Uh, but I would say that your company needs an ability to perform some sort of screening, most likely a background check on your employees prior to providing them access to a network that includes CUI or data repositories that include CUI. I can't believe I said CUI. <laughs> CUI. There we go. So yes. Uh, but again, there's Le the NIST 800-171 by definition is a standard that, a, that, a, that allows for companies to build processes around broad uh, control objective statements, right? Uh, that's why it's not 853, which was very specific on what it is and the frequency and all that stuff, right? So, so leverage that that ability to build that process that makes sense for your company, right? right. And you have to understand that there's a broad spectrum of compliance, right? There's non-compliance and there's spending a crap ton of money and doing everything. And then there's a whole bunch of stuff in the middle that, that most likely is going to work, right? There's a spectrum of defensibility. As long as you feel that you met the intent and the spirit of the, the objective of the controller requirement that you're talking about, then you will be okay. And this is coming from someone who's been audited a bunch of times, and I used to be an auditor for 15 years prior to this career. Thank you. Um, let's see, another general question, and actually, Mike, this one might be best for you since you are, since you take, take part in the CMMC AB stuff. So where do I find a list of approved auditors? Uh, I think it's on the AB website. Uh, I do I'm, think so. Honestly, there are eight of them now. <laughs> you know, there's four or five of them, right? And I, I know they're still working through that, so I would just go on the CMMC AB website. Uh, make sure you uh, tune into the CMMC AB town halls because that's kind of the formal mechanism for them to discuss kind of where they are with the ecosystem. And again, there's likely going to be an opportunity to engage these auditors prior to the rule going live, right? And we. DOD said that there's going to be some incentive to do that. Now, they haven't documented what that is, but they've thrown some ideas out there. So I'm sure you can go find out where that's been written and reported upon. But there will be an incentive for companies to lean in to the CMMC ecosystem to engage an auditor early, right? That will then be effective, you know, moving into the rule. Great. So I think that actually concludes us for, for today. I want to thank everybody for hanging in there with us. Thanks everybody for all your questions. It helped really drive this discussion. We do have just some general sources again of useful information out there. If you do request this deck, you'll obviously get this as another reference um, to go to go take a look at. Just one more plug to please um, fill out that exit poll. As I mentioned, this helps us drive our discussion points. It helps us determine the next set of speakers you'd like to hear from and the topics you'd like us to cover. So please go ahead and take out and, and, and take a minute to fill out that exit poll. I want to thank Tim and Mike for your participation today. Thanks so much for joining us and thank you all for your attendance today. All right. Thank you.